Okay, so we are in session 33 today and uh, we'll, we'll continue with our HR project. In this session, we will walk through the implementing the department module, the search scenario. We will walk through the each and every layer implementation. How can we accomplish a search uh, scenario uh, in our project? And also we'll do a retrieve scenario. How can we retrieve data based on the key that you pass in from the form? And also update scenario, how can we implement an updation of a given records on the form. And also we'll see ASP.NET validations in detail starting with client side versus server side validations. We will look into the um, validations using the validation controls which are out of box in ASP.NET. And also we'll see a function based validation, so how can we, how can we do that, which is a traditional way of doing uh, uh, validations at the server side and also we'll see VAB which is a validation application block uh, out of the enterprise library 5.0. Uh, it does have multiple flavors. We'll see a configuration based uh, validation using VAB as well as data annotations based validation using VAB and also using attribute uh, based validation using VAB. So we'll see a lot of interesting uh, things about ASP.NET validations today. So let's kick off session 33. Just to recap on our, on our last uh, session, so we have actually done with the department uh, module, creating uh, the record, new records in the database, and also we have written a stored frog for retrieving. And we have integrated of course, written the, from the UI till the uh, database tier. We did uh, implement the end-to-end, -end where I am able to create a new record. Okay, I want to go back to the bottom part for now. I just enable it for a reason. Okay, and this, just give me a second. Yeah, so we just want, uh, I want to just test this again to make sure it's working and uh, say what else so medical department and head of the department is 100 or say 109 I hope I have 100 we're just uh, testing the happy path just to make sure it's working And state, I will say, PS Okay, so well known data. Okay, I will just continue. Okay, it saved successfully. So let, we'll just see if the record got saved or not using our grid view. So, yes, uh, we are able to save it successfully. So, one part is uh, done. So what we're going to continue with that is um, also doing an update. So if we do a select here, we were able to actually do the update uh, in this screen. In this case, I don't want to do this, right? We're going to completely do from the BWL and DAL layer, wherein the way we have done for employee. Okay. So what we need to do that is first we need to retrieve the department uh, information and show it in the screen. In other words, we are we we might uh, we want to create a department search screen. So in, in this employee screen, we don't have a search searching capabilities, right? So we need to implement a, a screen which has a searching capabilities. So that we're going to start for now. And in addition, after once we done the searching search screen, we will uh, go and uh, associate uh, or integrate with the other modules like go and manage the, uh, once upon clicking the respective line item in the department search page it need to come to the department manage department screen and if we pick the respective value then it should show up the details it should pull the details for the selected department and show it up here and then do the update operation okay so we already done the update uh, module so now we're going to do the retrieval part and the search part okay OK, 
Okay, so I want to disable the tracing part for now because I enabled it for a reason. So I am going to disable this part so that we don't see access information in the browser. Very well. So now for retrieval part, again it goes back to our database. So of course the data is resides in the database, so we need to handle it from the database. As you, as we know, uh, as we did in the previous session, we're going to do from the bottom up. So the first thing would be to create a uh, get department stored proc. So right now there is no such stored proc, and I'm going to add a new stored proc saying um, I will say yeah search search department. So we're going to have a searching algorithm here, um, search and sort proc, which is going to take the department uh, name. Let, let us see what are the columns we have with the department table. So we have a name. I would go with the name. Oops. The parameter will be just name. Okay, there's no problem to keep it simple. Achar, I would say, I think it's 50, I will keep it 50. So that's one of the in parameter. And of course, uh, we don't have any out parameters. So the idea here is to accept a, a department name and retrieve the result set based on the input. In other words, uh, it could be, um, like for example, I would like to implement like a searching capital. Like if for example, I have a department like a um, search with the given keywords. In other words, um, like I just created a medical record, and in in which case, if someone asks for with M, so retrieve anything that matches with M. Okay, so that will be as a normal ideal scenario to go with. In this case, what I'm going to do is it's going to be a pretty select statement. Okay, select. Um, I would say, okay, let's have ID, comma, name. Okay, so that's the reason we need to enclose within the square, uh, square bracket so that any of the preserved keywords will not be conflicted there. Okay, so HOD, comma, location. Location is an ID, right? Okay, so we're going to select all these. Um, columns and say from the table name which is department and so we, this will give you all the records right so we're going to filter out with where clause where I have a ID oh sorry the name name so in this case uh, we are going to do a like operation uh, in database, I hope you, are, uh, you all know the uh, like operator that you can make use of it and uh, that I'm going to make use of it now here. So like and for like to search for the ki uh, kind of records we need to apply the percentile and also within the uh, context I'm going to pass the parameter. Parameter and then again like. So this should take care of the search to match for the given name or following with anything. Okay, so let me save this and see. Of course, the, oh, in um, SQL Server, so this is all you need to write. So if you have a select statement and run the stored proc either from your ID or anything else. So the result set is automatically transfer transformed to the respective data set. So you don't have to do any magics here. So because the SQL Server, the way it works with the .NET, it's implicitly going to manage the result set into the data set conversion. So in this case, I just saved it. Uh, nothing else to do. In just in case, if you are really working with Oracle database, it's going to be completely different. The Oracle has something called a RIF cursor in which you need to make use of the RIF, RIF cursor to return the uh, output like this. In which case the RIF cursor is going to be an out parameter for your stored proc and uh, the re result set is going to be uh, returned using the RIF cursor. So that's the major difference between Oracle stored procs and the SQL Server stored procs. Okay, so uh, this is done. 
So we are able to retrieve it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to build the search page. So this is as simple as this, okay? And if at all you have multiple fields, you can actually uh, have the respect to multiple fields and apply them in the where clause. In real world, you might, uh, the, the search might be a little complicated. So we're just doing a very simple case um, uh, in this case because we just wanted to see how we can develop. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop a search page. I'm just thinking of whether I can add it to the same existing home page or a new page, okay? Uh, what I can do is uh, rather create a new page, okay? So we're going to create a brand new page, in which case I'll pick the web form using master page and I'm going to name this as department search. And I'm going to pick the respective um, master page. In, in this case, the master page fits for this is the BWL. Within this, I have a general master, and that's the uh, module specific master page. And the department already exists. Okay, so it can overwrite it. Okay, so the page is created and within this page what I'm going to do is um, create a search parameter. Right now we have a search parameter so I'm going to create a label, there is a label button. I'm going to drag and drop simply and of course uh, this label I'm going to change the text later but um, in this case I would want to add a text box as well. Where is the text box? Yeah, here you go. I add a text box and of course the last one with the post back uh, event, the button. Where is the button? Yep, here you go. Button. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to completely use the ID. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not that used to use the ID. That's the reason I'm actually searching for these tools. Otherwise, I, in most of the cases, uh, I normally go with the writing the code. So I will go with what I am comfortable with, okay? And this is the label, or the, this text is going to be saying uh, department name. So you're going to key in the department name and the text here, uh, ID is going to be txt department name. And uh, yes, and that's all I think we need. Uh, if you want to apply the max term, that's fine. Otherwise, that's that is also fine. I would like to apply. Um, style sheet. Oops, my bad. Uh, we have something called table content. That's what I'm going to pick which is going to be much better. And I'm going to apply the same style sheet for the label as well. And the finally the button. Okay. And button I'm going to say search. And the button is going to be uh, btn search. Perfect. So our ID is done. So what are we going to write in the search and what are we going to write in the, uh, of course the other other control we need is the data grid wherein the result, set, result is going to be showed and that should be available within the data group here and grid view, yep, so I'll just drop the grid view control. Perfect, so what I'm going to do here is uh, go and configure the data source. So I'm going to just uh, leave this as is, don't worry. So in real time we might change the name, but again, so real time things might be dynamic, so we are just making use of the ID. There's no harm in doing this way as well, as long as your connection strain. So yeah, so one step back, so I'm going to pick the um, Instead of uh, picking the table, I'm going to pick the SQL statement or uh, stored property. Okay, in this case, uh, either you can 
uh, write the query here the way I have written in the stored proc. Otherwise, in this case, I have, since I already have the stored proc, I want to pick the stored proc. And if I see my search department, the search department database stored proc is visible here. Okay, and I'll pick that and continue next. And here is the parameters uh, screen wherein it asks you to pick the parameter. In this case, I'm going to pick, actually you have a wide variety of uh, source that you can pick from, uh, including the query string, uh, form, control, and so on. In this case, I'm going to pick a control on my page because I have a control. And in this case, I have a text department name and the default value I can specify. In this case, I'm not going to specify any default value. Okay, and uh, which is then uh, so this parameter for, for the parameter name I'm mapping the uh, the value from the control. So I don't have to write any code there. So it's uh, directly bind to the stored prop parameter. And I'm going to test the query here by passing uh, say med and hit OK. So let me see if it returns any data. Yes, I can able to get the data for my stored proc. So my my stored proc is good, my grid is good, so I'm just finishing, uh, hitting the finish button. Good. So what I need here is a selection. So because I want to be able to select the respective line item so that I can navigate to the next page. Okay, so that's all I need here. And once I'm done, of course, I'll pick the auto formats and pick the respective uh, predefined template whichever fits good for me. In this case, I like this one. I'm okay. Good. So we are done with this uh, page for now. So we just uh, run this page and see. And of course, before I run this page, I need to hook this up to the respective um, uh, master page so that uh, the department search also uh, comes in. Um, yeah, I can go down into this. Go to the designer. Check it out, and of course, I can go and add up edit menu items. Check it out, and I'm going to say add a new item. Okay. Okay, so that's all I need. And uh, with the search, so menu item, I don't have to actually do this. I can go back here and uh, hit the source. And in this case, I have a search here and the navigate URL. I'm going to pick the navigate URL. I just want to copy this and uh, put it from my search department. And in this case, it's department search page. Perfect. So this should navigate me to the uh, department search page. Okay, so now let's uh, kick off our page and test it out. And here comes the search department and initially there's nothing and I'll say med and say hit search. Do I get anything? I am able to get the data back and also hit the search so I'm able to get it. Perfect. So it works good and if you see I actually did nothing with the button control. Did I write any piece of code for this button control? None. But still uh, I'm able to see the results out upon clicking the button, right? So the reason being the post pack. So the button has the post pack um, event. So not not all controls have the post pack uh, events uh, available. So it's the button control is one of the uh, control that has the post pack, uh, which fires automatically and refresh the 
grid control. And since uh, we bind the, the text box value to the grid control, uh, it, when it, whenever it refreshes it, it's going to get the data for you. Okay, and again for select, we did not actually write any code for this to, of course, so the intention for us to, upon selection of this, it need to navigate to the next page. Okay, and that's all you need to do. And if at all you would you want to write any code for, for the button click event, then only code would be to bind the uh, data. So it this would be this dot. Uh, where is my control? Grid view dot bind data. If at all you would want to write this, only thing is you you can you just need to do this, nothing else. Okay, so that is done. So your search page is done. Um, so we are clear now. So we are able to do the search page uh, probably in just 15 minutes time. And now what we are going to do is navigate to our manage department. Okay, so we have a manage department here. We want to navigate to this page upon clicking of the Select, uh, selection button. Okay, so that's going to be looking like response to redirect and stuff like that. And uh, what I'm going to do is, since I already have this, um, code already written. So I just want to make use of it. I'm sorry, I'm looking in the wrong direction. So it's not going to be too complicated. It's just have to read the value from it and pass it on to the next page. Okay, so we'll try to save some time. And in this case, it's only a department ID that we're going to read through, right? I just want to modify the code wherever applicable. And of course, the grid view is same and the selected value. So what we're going to do is we're actually uh, converting the respective grid views um, uh, selected value. Uh, this is actually coming from the sender. The sender will have the grid view, which we are typecasting it to uh, get to the value. So how can you do this is a, a big good question. So if you would like, to, how do you know how to do all this stuff? I will show you a simple shortcut after once I'm going to run this. And in this case, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to make use of this session state. So, and in this case, what I'm trying to do here is um, soon after the user select the respective department from the search results, I'm actually saving the selected department ID in the session state. That's one of the way you can actually pass it uh, across uh, multiple pages. just need this and within that I have I'm actually making use of the constants here I'm just creating a constants for whatever I'm making use of the session state so that because whatever uh, variables or constant values that you might use across pages it's always the best practice is to go and create a constant for that so that if at all you want to modify uh, that value then you can change it easily uh, here instead of touching everywhere. Okay, so I'm just making the uh, same thing here. And uh, yes, this is going to go away and department search page. Good. So in this case, I'm going to make use of the, the ID that I, oops, got, sorry department ID. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm getting the ID that is um, uh, selected from the grid and adding that to the session state. And uh, and I'm redirecting to the, of course in this case I need to redirect to the manage department page. So this is how the navigation between the pages uh, do happen. And uh, oops, I'm jumping here. And it, ideally, in the, most of the cases, the URLs, whatever I'm uh, right, right now hard coding in my code, they are also retrieved dynamically from any resource file. And uh, that's how it's going to be handled. 
In this case, I'm actually passing in two different ways, okay, uh, just for the demo sake. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't really make sense because I'm actually passing the, um, going to pass, of course, the department ID, QS, department ID as a query string as well as through the session state, okay. So I'm just trying to demonstrate the both the ways you can pass the selected value from one page to another page, okay. So the reason why we are doing this is if you see the each of the page, each of the page life cycle is completely different from one another and the internet itself is a stateless. That means the information that is being uh, sent as a part of the request and response is never going to be persisted anywhere in the in the internet. That's how the, the basic fundamentals of an internet if you, I hope you already know of that piece, that's why we're not stressing that area. Um, so we need to have some mechanism wherein you can actually uh, persist uh, data, uh, not in persisting to a, uh, uh, when I say persistence, uh, I'm not mean to say put it in somewhere uh, forever, uh, that you can do also, uh, but in this case uh, we might need some information that need to be available throughout a different uh, context. So in this case, I'm actually passing the, uh, using a query string, I'm actually passing. So query string, if you see, the, it's part of the uh, your URL itself and it starts with the question mark and uh, key is equal to value pair. And this key is again going to be retrieved at the end. And this is very well visible in the URL, okay. And of course, there are ways you when using which you can uh, encrypt those query strings. Uh, and uh, decrypt them. So there, there. Um, if you use the Entlib uh, security or cryptography um, blocks, then you can um, do that kind of encryption as well, so that the end user don't see what you are passing between the pages. Otherwise, it's open for users to tamper this uh, query string. Okay, and uh, to avoid the such tampering, uh, and also to avoid more hurdle of having encryptions session is the best way to do, but this is not going to be visible to the end user. Okay, so just want to demonstrate both the ways. And now in this case, the, the navigation is done, so it's going to navigate to this page, and within this page, I should be able to read that value. So in this page, I'm, I will be coming to the page load event. So once I read my ID, what I need to do is I need to retrieve that respective department uh, details and show it on the screen. So that's what the next item and in this case first of all we need to read the query string. How can we read it? What we're going to do is here I have, okay, I can create a string. Okay, string I'll say department ID is equal to it's going to be request from it's going to come in as part of my request dot uh, query string dot get get index or a string. So in this case, uh, the query string, I'm going to of course. Uh, so in this case, I'm not using a constant, so this is a problem. I just have to copy it and use it the same query string. Okay, so that um, both handshakes happen properly. So in this case, I'm, I'm going to get the string out here. So what I immediately need to see if this is uh, not uh, blank, okay? That I can simply check with uh, string dot is null or white space is the best place to do. Department ID. Then I will do certain things here. Okay, if this is not this I should be good and in this case what I'm going to do is um, of course now I ensure that the the query string did not return any null uh, in this case I have a valid department ID that means this indicates that this page is hit by some other page 
and this is going to be in a update mode. So this is what is going to hint me that it's, it's uh, the navigation point. Uh, if it has a query string that indicates that it's going to be in a update mode, otherwise it's going to be in a new mode. So I need to differentiate that mode, otherwise uh, I cannot uh, handle the respective uh, modes uh, in the same page. Okay, so how I'm going to do that is uh, by maintaining uh, a class level variable here, uh, which is going to be, I did have a uh, enum that's going to be stating like this, uh, which is going to be used for managing my, I already have a helper, so I'm going to say, yeah, it's an enum should be under this, yeah, screen mode. It's in the screen mode, I will say mode. So this is my module level variable. I'm going to track all this. In this case, I'll say mode is equal to helper dot screen mode dot. It's an update mode, right? So I hope you know the enums part, right? So we did talk about the enums in our sessions and this here goes the enum definition which has a three predefined values and it has its own ID. So this is the ideal case where you can make use of enums. Instead of uh, having a flag so setting up like one, two, three, this is more uh, human readable way to handle the values like this. So in this case, I'm going to maintain a class level to track what which mode it is going to be and um, use this mode across the page, okay? Make sense? Now in this case, uh, what, what is that if the mode is uh, update mode, I should do, I should retrieve the data from the database. Before I do any further uh, line of code, what I need to do again is uh, uh, write the retrieval part of the respective, uh, respective line item, which is the departments. So for that, again, I have to jump back to the database. So we'll do from the bottom up. In this case, we'll need to uh, write another stored proc which is going to be get department okay in the get department it's going to take the department ID right it's going to be simply ID and we'll keep it in and of course it doesn't have any return type okay and I'm going to say begin begin and end. in this case it's going to be the same query as select in this case I could actually copy from my department oops sorry search department it's going to be the same query I need except the where, where class change, okay? Where is my get department? Of course, it's not yet saved, so it's still here. Okay, so I'm going to retrieve the data for the ID, of course, is equal to ID. So that's all I need here, nothing else. So I save this which is good. So when it's saved, it's, that means it's successful. Now I'm going to write the respect to, of course, the next immediate tire is, layer is your data access layer, wherein I have a department DAC, and within which, of course, I will be writing the implementation for get. We did write the update call, and in this case, we're going to make the get collections, no, in this case, it's only get, okay? So we're going to implement the get part, which is going to retrieve one department, okay? In this case, that's the ideal case for us. Okay, so how, if you remember the last time we did implement the data access layer using the enterprise library, and we're going to do the same thing, database, database db is equal to database dot of uh, database factory actually factory dot create database of the respective connection and which is here 
this is the connection. I could actually make a, this connection as well, also a constant so that uh, because it's been used at multiple places, if at all really want to change the name, you can apply it. Okay, it's good. And soon after that, what we need is the department. Of course, the object that's coming in. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so of course, uh, see if you see the get itself is scribbing. So as my uh, way of writing goes like this because I want to satisfy the get part uh, and then continue with the other one. So in this case, I'll say department obj department is equal to new department and of course return this department out. So that's the first thing I would normally do. Return department and now populate this department with the database values. How will I do that? I'm going to, right now, I have this thing and next what well, next thing is db command cmd uh, is equal to db dot get stored proc command and for this I'm going to pass the stored proc name. So that's all and the stored proc name is here I'm not sure if I can copy this. Okay, I will copy this way and go back here and put the stored proc here. Okay, and of course, and after that, what I'm going to do here is um, db dot add the parameters. Okay, db dot add in parameter, and the db command is cmd, and the of course the property also the parameter is id db type is uh, db type dot int 32 that's an integer and the value in this case the value is coming from obj department dot id perfect so that's all we need to pass as an in parameter and of course we need to retrieve the out uh, in this case, if you see the get department is actually returning some uh, select query. That means the output of a select query, which is going to be a written as a uh, data set. So that's why we need to actually invoke the db dot execute data set. Okay, we did talk about this in the last time. CMD, we're going to pass the command to it. And of course, what this is going to do is it's going to return me data set, right? And ds is equal to execute data set. But now the real trouble comes in. We need to actually transform this data set, which is going to be of a, which internally going to have a data table and which is going to represent the rows and columns of the result set. We need to transform that into the respect to department object. So for that, um, actually 4.0 does have a couple of uh, automated mappings wherein you can use the domain object model to map the database result set with respect to objects directly, which in which case what it expects is that the uh, your, your object's uh, properties or fields are exactly having the same name to that of your result set. Uh, that's how it, it works with. I'm not going to go that route instead I'm going to go with the same old uh, traditional route wherein we're going to have a mapper created uh, in this case I did exactly the same way for the employee as well or address as well I'm going to actually make a copy of uh, this mapper and make this as a department mapper what this mapper is going to do is it's going to map the respective database uh, uh, data set to the respective object. So this is what the map mapper does. In this case, I'm going to, and again, this is a static class, which I can actually make use of it directly. And I'm going to change this to, so since this is a copy paste, so this is the map ad, map department, I will say, instead of address. Okay, and in this case, uh, yeah. so this is what we're trying to do. In this case, we're going to get the data set as an in, 
and also we are actually going to get uh, as a reference if you see take a look at the ref keyword this is uh, this is the way if you want to handle uh, reference uh, pass in the parameter with reference okay what that is going to do is uh, whatever local variable you want to pass in and let me finish this depart Mind. okay OBJ department and of course this pop-up will help me to rename all which is going to be of course scripting uh, ID of course ID is going to come in and we we'll want to read that ID uh, just going to retain the ID in this case we'll need the name what else we have HOD location head I hope that those are the three things we have name HOD location that's all and ID is already populated so, um, so we don't want to do anything with that and in this case the of course the stored proc is having the column names as uh, name HOD and uh, location good and in this case, of course, this is scripting because it's going to be integer and the location is also integer and the name is, of course, it's fine. Okay. Oops. Loca location is, uh, of course, I am going to do is location.id. Remember, the so location is an address which is coming from a different table altogether. So, so in this case, we get only the ID. So using this ID, we need to also get the address, right? So how are we going to do that? We're going to go back to our data access layer, department DAC. And in this case, of course, I need to do the mapper part, right? So if you, we already came from there. So how did we... Uh, how can we make use of it? We just have to create the department mapper department mapper dot map department and pass in the data set and the uh, OBJ department. Okay, good. So this will take care of the department. So if you remember the okay, this is returning let me see why it's scribbing okay so because um, that's because of the ref keyword remember we have a ref we need to also specify this as a ref and that should take care of it so this ref is what it's doing is I don't want to actually override this object within this method so I want to because sin since I'm getting this object from the UI from the uh, outer layer uh, with populated with the department ID it's going to traverse through this block with the ID intact that's what I'm going to use it to um, do the database retrieval and then pass the same object to the mapper so that it's going to retain the ID what, what ideally we are doing is we are actually passing the object with the reference so whatever manipulations you're going to do within this block it's going to be um, retained uh, outside the block as well so that's the ref keyword is going to ensure that and uh, once we do that, we will have the object populated with the uh, written whatever the stored proc has written. Okay, but we are not yet done. So what's pending here is we need to also retrieve the address of the location, right? So what? How are we going to do that? We also we already have the address part uh, uh, done for employee. So we're going to make use of the same routine to populate the. Uh, location also so which is going to be completely outside this scope because this scope is going to do only the department so that is the workflow scope which is going to be handled in the other layer which is the BWC layer so within the context of uh, department DAC and get it is done okay and uh, it gets the department and we're going to go back to our next layer which is our BWL so if you take a look at the um, the employee BWC, it's done the similar way. So we're going to jump to department BWC. We will not refer there and get into the retrieve part of the department. 
in this case, we are going to do what? Of course, we will call the respective um, department DAC. Okay. Department DAC, OBJ department DAC. Okay. DAC is going to new department DAC. So we're going to create an instance of the department DAC first. Of course, the first thing I should do is the retrieval part. And I hope this thing is uh, probably the signature is wrong. In this case, I actually, if it is within the department BWC, it should be returning a de uh, department, not the employee. So I'm going to change the signature. Okay. Department OBJ department is equal to new department and of course the return okay now what we're going to do is OBJ department is equal to OBJ department DAC dot get and pass the OBJ department. Okay, good. Fine, so, so that's taken care. So we're going to retrieve the part. So get part is done. Now the next immediate part is we need to actually get the address as well. Okay, um, so address we're going to check now if this object OBJ department Okay, my default is picking the DAC, and that's where I'm getting into trouble. And if we were depart ID, if this is uh, not okay, not equal to zero. So just the int value is the default is uh, zero, and if this is not equal to zero, that's when I'll say that uh, oops, no, actually it's location dot ID. Location dot ID. If the okay, in other words. I'll check, uh, yes, because the location.id is what populated there and uh, we should be okay with the ID. If the ID is not equal to zero, then we're going to retrieve the location also, for which we're going to make use of the address, right? And here, uh, address DAC, OBJ, address DAC is going to new address DAC. Okay, so that should be taken care. Now OBJ address, now in this case, OBJ department dot location is equal to a address stack dot OBJ address stack dot get the, uh, in this case I need to pass the uh, OBJ department dot location. So I'm going to pass the address as an in and it's going to return me the location. So in this case it's scribbing again cannot implicitly convert the address of course I need to explicitly convert it because it's going to return it's going to return HR domain base. Perfect. So this should take care of my address as well. So I just wanted to go back and double check if it is going to return the uh, the address ID as well. Yeah, in this case, it's doing the same riff. So I hope it's going to take care of it. So now my get part is done and the retrieval part is done. And I hope I did not forget anything else. If at all I forget, um, of course, it's going to create at runtime. We're going to see that. Good, so BWC part is done. And we're going to jump all the way back to the UI. And where we are, we are inside the manage department. So in this case, uh, we are in update mode. And what, it, what we're going to do here is uh, retrieve it. Retrieve and populate it. So we need to retrieve. The first thing is to we need to retrieve in the page load, and the page load we're going to get the department ID here, and we're going to pass that uh, ID to retrieve it. So in this case, what I'm going to make is write a, a 
local procedure the way I have here private get and populate department okay and in this case what I'm going to do is uh, pass in some value which is the department ID in this case okay department ID is going to be a parameter here string department ID okay so as usual it's going to be wide of course I did not uh, put the void here what this one will do is get the department ID and make the BWC call okay so it's going to be department BWC or BJ BWC is equal to a new department BWC and then We'll also have department OBJ department is equal to new department and of course we'll populate the OBJ department dot ID since it is an uh, int I'm going to type cast it here okay and now what I'm going to do is oops oh this is a string I could use the convert dot to and 32 and pass the department ID this should be taken care and soon after this I need to do is um, OBJ department is equal to what is this OBJ department BWC dot retrieve the OBJ department Oops. so this should get me the department populated with the objects in this case of course I need to type explicitly type cast to department because the retrieve is actually returning the HR base class perfect so once we do this what we need to do the next is we need to populate the UI probably I have already done this so, so this is a create object and which is going to be the opposite to it so what I'm going to do here is of course uh, make use of the same thing and write another one say populate department okay and this is going to take department OBJ perfect and in this case uh, we will not have this and uh, Okay, so this is going to be one other way around. So we're going to get rid of all these. Uh, we're going to just make use of the control names and no written statement is equal to obj department dot name. department dot head and of course this is going to create because I need to pass this as a string I can simply make it as two string and the address data of course the address data is obj department dot location this should take care of it and this is the text and uh, what is wrong here oops because I use this yeah. we should take care and of course this shouldn't return anything so perfect so this should be taken care of. and once I have this and I need to just call this dot populate page we pass in the OBJ department 
Okay, so far so good. And uh, the next immediate thing, we're going to call this pass the department ID. So that's what we need to do. Okay, so we will start. So this is a live session, so things can go up and back. This is a kind of a development that we are doing, uh, and it's completely live. Okay, so now we're going to, so we will have some errors, but we will handle them. Okay, that's how it's going to go. And search here, and then say med, okay, ME is also fine. And select the medical, which is 19. And I hope I have the ID now. And I'm going to just hit run and see if it all things work. Now, it did fail here because the location itself is null, and that's when it is failed. Okay, let's go back. And yes, because when it's coming in, it did not get the location ID. We'll go back and see. So we'll add a breakpoint here and uh, let it go and then go back and again hit 19 and hit F5 and now get into this code. So what went wrong is what we're going to see. So data set got fired perfectly and do we have any data for that? Oops. I'll go and see in a quick watch and see the data set here. So there is no data, unfortunately, for the given ID. So it looks like my stored proc did not return any data for the given ID. And oops, the ID is null. So something went wrong. Oh, yeah. The reason being because I actually created a new instance of the department instead of taking what is coming in. So I did not make use of the value that is coming in. Let me... BJ department, I should be actually making use of the HR domain base. Okay, this is one thing I should be doing. And DAC, perfect. So before this, we have the we actually need to walk through from the page to see where all the places we are actually navigating. Okay, not this one. Here we go. From here, we're actually going to the BWC Retrieval. BWC Retrieval here as well. We should not be doing a new department. Instead, we should be making use of the same department that is coming in. Okay, OBJ domain base, perfect. And after this, where else we are making use of it? Uh, that dot get. Okay, that's where we are. Hop. So, so this is what ideally happens in a development lifecycle. Code, run fix the issues and again rerun, fix it, run, fix it, run and it's a cycle. Search department, M is hit search and medical, 19. This time I'm sure it should work. Yep, there you go. So we are able to successfully retrieve the data for the given ID. So we are done. So the next important thing is the update part. And in this case, uh, right now the save is actually handling only the cr new creation, right? It, now it should not it need to handle the update. And for now, we actually, if you remember, we have already done the uh, update par update implement implementation from the BWC layer last time. We have that code ready. We should be working good. And only thing is, I need to attach it from the UI so that we're going to handle it. It should be straightforward. 
But only thing is we're going to determine whether the page is in um, the update mode or the create mode, which is why we are actually making use the, using of the uh, making use of the the mode. In this case, we're actually updated it. Otherwise, uh, else this is going to be. In other words, I did not set this to this. Uh, what if I initialize the? Okay, I can actually initialize this mode is equal to helper dot uh, screen mode dot create new. Instead of doing else, this is also fine. What happens in this case? The mode by default will be create new, and uh, if at all this condition satisfied, it's going to be turned to update. Or you can also do it as a if and else statement. That either way is fine. It means same. Good. So by default, this is going to be create new. In which case, my save button need to handle that, right? And what all I am doing here in this case, PWC till till this part, it will remain same. And in this case, uh, yes, this whole part. Yeah, the create new. Okay, so this whole part, even I can, yeah, this whole part I can keep it. Uh, yeah, only thing I was worried about the text that's going as saved successfully. I think it's fine, it's generic enough, so I can keep this out. Uh, now in this case, I'll say switch case. And uh, it's going to be switch to what? Switch to my mode. And and again, this is your, your switch statements. If you remember, we did cover all this stuff. And uh, case screen mode dot create new. And there's a block going to be. And the case screen mode dot update. And there's going to be a block here. Okay. Oops. Okay. And within this, of course, we need to actually do one small thing here, which is break. Otherwise, this is not going to be working. If you remember, that's one uh, key thing with this switch statement, where you need to actually specify the break statement. What we need to do here is we will be, in case of create new, we're going to make use of this call. Okay. And otherwise, what we're going to call is this update. We're going to make a call for update dot update. Update and I will pass the department. Looks like we have a lot of errors. We, oops, this is a typo. And the name errors, okay, so it's gone out of scope, looks like. Where is the errors? Errors are actually declared here, and we will take this out and place it here so that it is accessible throughout. And of course, we will not redeclare this. In this case, we're gonna remember the create new will actually return the uh, error. Uh, dictionary of key and value that we're going to make use of here. Okay, and what else is wrong? It uh, does not exist in the current context. Why not? Yeah, that's gone. It is an uh, unassigned problem. What we're going to do is, uh, is it called two? Null. You can initialize with a null value, it should be fine. So yeah, so we are good. So our save now is taken care of the create new situation and the update situation. Perfect. And what else we need? We don't need anything else, right? For now. And now the page should be working good for both the situations. We'll add a breakpoint here since it's a brand new code for us. And uh, now hit run. OK, 
Okay, you go to the department search again and do the ME, same search one and select the 19 and we have retrieved medical. Now I will change something here. I'll say 100 medical and uh, yeah, whatever. I'll re because this will indicate if it all this value is changed, that address is also taken care. Now I'll say medical or 100. Okay, so just uh, some value change and I hit save. Now the click is entered. Now the mode is should already get set and that's when it's get into the update mode here and it's uh, hitting the update call and of course it looks successfully and it is successful so I will go back to search screen hit the ME same thing and I should have the updated one perfect now this time I can see the department uh, screen is successfully updating um, so what we're going to do right now is uh, take a few minutes break, uh, not too much, like uh, a minute or two, and then come back uh, after the break. Uh, I will be walking through the already done example, already done a similar project. I have a copy of another project, uh, which will uh, show you the the latest editions that I have done on the. Uh, complete uh, pr uh, department module itself and we will we'll continue from that version. So we'll continue to the last one. Um, so after a couple of uh, tweaks and tricks, uh, so they finally the, they have uh, completed the page and the department page especially. Okay, so we're going to start. Uh, yes, we're going to start demo. So, in addition to what we had, um, we also have a couple of more to the department table now. So, I have added even the location address as well uh, to return from the result set. So, with, uh, now we can see the department as well as the HOD and the location ID, of course, and their respective address. And now I'm going to pick the respective item. So, I'm able to go into the manage department table and I'm going to modify this uh, with some number, say 2500 and 2500, just the address and the other one. Uh, department main details and hit save so I, be, I am able to see the save now okay so so the save is good so I am able to see the um, updated one record here which is good and then in addition to that as you see the the search results is actually pulling the all the existing records in the first instance and also it's going to apply the filter based on my selection okay and if I remove this and hit search, then it's going to give me everything. So that's a new change again. So how did I how did I implement that? So we just added a, a new uh, clause to the database store proc to check if the input uh, to check if the input uh, name is blank or not. If it is empty then I'm actually getting everything otherwise nothing. So I'm just extended the search department store proc to check the name if, it is, if the length is zero and if it is null and in that case I'm not actually doing a where clause otherwise I'm doing the where clause with the like operator. So this way if I pass uh, nothing then I'm going to get everything otherwise the respective one. And in addition to that, uh, if you know the database query, I hope you already know the SQL scripts. So in this case, I use the left outer join to bring in the address as well and display in the table. So the left outer join, if you know, it's going to join both the tables based on the given criteria. In this case, the location and the ID and the address and return all the data. Um, from uh, from department, it's going to get me all the uh, records irrespective of the records having address or not. So the first thing it's going to see the matching records as well as the records that doesn't have the address also. So it's, in that case, it's going to give me all the information. So that's what we're able to see 
here. Sorry. So that's what we're able to see here. Good. Uh, in this case, I have address for all the records, so that's why it's not uh, giving any, any nulls on the right-hand side. What we're going to do is we'll create a new record now. So we'll test the department create new creation. So I added a new button there, which will navigate to this Manage Department, in which case I can create a new record here. Okay, And I will say this time, I'll say Mobile. Okay, some name and 109 as HOD and address I'm going to leave blank and we got a problem because the address uh, I'm I'm expecting to key in but the address is not keyed in so this is where we want to get into because now we will get into the validation of the screen so with respect to the code I have uh, coded that I'm always expecting the address to get in but now the user did not key in an address and now the the address breaks. So now the next topic is our validation. So we need to ensure from the user that they don't enter anything wrong that we are expecting. Okay, how do we enforce? That's the first thing. Okay, so to get into the validation, I would like to run through the couple of slides that I have uh, and then we'll get into the implementation part. Okay, so that will make a clear sense what we are doing here. Okay. So this is about the ASP.NET validations and we know very well about the client and server side of course the web application we did talk about this slide in the initial sessions so the request comes in from the client which is a browser of course and the request passes to the server side and also the server side the processing is going to be done and the response is sent back to the client. This is a basic uh, client-server architecture that we see in the internet. Now, the validation part, we can actually do validations from both the sides. One at the client side here, that is on the browser itself, and the second one is at the server side. So the critical thing here with the web applications is that uh, uh, most likely you might end up doing both. Okay, there, there are certain reasons that we're going to see. Uh, one, at the client side, whenever you do a client side validation, what happens is the validation is done on the browser itself when the user submits it. And before the data is ensured that it's, it, it follows your validation rules, it's not going to pass to the server side. So what you're going to save here is the round trip to the server. Okay, so that's a big advantage you gain, gain with the client side validation. And of course, so what happens if um, if you validate at the client and it's passed it, so you don't really have to validate at the server side, okay, you might ask. So in addition to the client side validation, you actually supposed to even validate the server side also, because the internet is a stateless mechanism and wherein the, uh, the information that is validated from the server side, client side, when it is traversed to the server side, you can never guarantee the, the information that's keyed in by the client is not tampered by anyone in the middle. So as we keep on hearing about the hacking and, uh, and it's a very common uh, scenario, uh, I could demonstrate to you how to even do hacking, but I'm not a, like a hacking professional, I won't do that. But technically, we can actually leverage a couple of tools, a couple of tools like the Fiddler, or the HTTP analyzers, if you browse around and find it, it's it's not illegal stuff, but it's uh, hacking is one of the good things, I would say. In other words, it, it it's all depends how you look at it. Uh, of course, uh, as long as you don't harm anything, it's fine, because hacking will actually going to uh, unroot all the uh, loopholes that our internet is providing, So, which will help, again, to block those loopholes. Okay, so it's always good to uh, pinpoint the loophole so that someone can fix the loophole so that we, the internet is going to be more and more secure down the line. And now what we're talking about the validation is again uh, based on those best practices uh, how to best validate your uh, request that's going into the server side and how you best you can protect your information. 
Again, validation is a little different to that topic, uh, in which case you might go with an HTTP S protocol or, S, uh, or SSL layer uh, transport communication, which is going to be a secure uh, socket layer communication or the HTTPS itself is an encrypted one. So in this case, the validation aspects uh, again falls r literally into the same dimension, uh, wherein the user information once it's keyed in and validated at the client side, need to or it cannot be guaranteed that it reaches the server with the same way because anyone can tamper your information uh, in between the gates. So what happens, what need to happen again is a server-side validation. So in this context, what we see here is even if you do a client-side validation or not, server-side validation is important because even if you skip validating a server client-side, all that happens is the round trip. That's the only thing you're going to lose. Otherwise, uh, security-wise, you will be more secure if you do a server-side validation. So that's a key point to know. Again, of course, you might end up in, with the redundancy of validation. You might do the same validation of the client side and also the same validation of the server side. That's what you're going to end up. But of course, both will give you a good, uh, strong mechanism wherein your requests uh, or invalid requests uh, count can go down if you do it the client side validation. That's going to be very, very important for large load applications wherein if it is for example if you're um, if you're doing a railway reservation system wherein uh, uh, thousands of people are interacting with the system at the same time and it's like a lot of concurrent user load is going to be high in which case you definitely want to restrict uh, some of the inputs at the client side itself before the round trip happens and the load on the server can be reduced okay and at the, at the same time you need to also validate the server side so that's the basic uh, thing with the uh, ASP.NET or any web-based application. It's not specific to ASP.NET. It's uh, common to any web-based application. Application. So we see what we have the client-side validation. So client-side validation works using the client JavaScript. This is again now specific to the .NET or ASP.NET. Okay, so the first slide is completely about um, the generic uh, or general validation rules. And now we are entering into the specific to ASP.NET. Okay, so client-side validation works using the client-side JavaScript. Uh, by default, the validation script for even ASP.NET is Java because Java always uh, uh, dominated the market uh, since the beginning. Although Microsoft has its own uh, scripting language called the VBScript, most of you know, but uh, no one used that uh, ideally. Uh, JavaScript is the most popular one and even Microsoft even uh, supports uh, JavaScript by default. That means it's a default scripting language uh, even in ASP.NET. And of course it doesn't require any binary components uh, that uh, uh, need to be deployed for that to work because uh, J uh, JavaScript is completely uh, uh, run by the browser itself. The browsers are well aware of the, the basic scripting languages. One of them is the uh, JavaScript. And of course, there are several other scripting langu uh, languages like CGA, Perl, if you, if you have heard, and also the VBScript. And of course, most popular is JavaScript. And of course, the client validations, uh, the client server validation only works um, in place of Internet, Internet Explorer 4 and later because of the uh, Internet Explorer DOM model. The, the client scripts uh, that are packaged out in the ASP.NET, uh, uh, the validation uh, will rely on the document object model. Uh, we're going to see that uh, in, uh, in the source code once we do the validations and uh, what kind of code is rendered out, we'll see, okay? And uh, because of that, that support the earlier versions of the Internet Explorer or earlier versions of the browsers, I don't have that knowledge of the latest uh, advantage, uh, latest uh, technologies that have been introduced later. So that obviously, so older version or browsers will not be uh, helpful. So that's the reason everyone recommends you to get the latest browser in place. Uh, that's why the latest browsers can know the latest technology and and they can gain the advantage of uh, enforcing them. And it's recommended to have a server-side validation in respect of the client-side validation. That's what we just talked about. Okay, so in other words, we'll see the conclusion what we're going to arrive once we walk through all these uh, validations. In, okay. 
So the built-in ASP.NET validation controls. So ASP.NET, again, as, as we know, the Microsoft is very good in giving you a good tool set. And for validations as well, ASP.NET has uh, brought in a couple of uh, validation tools, uh, controls, instead of you writing the same code every time. Again, it, it's a general thumb rule at Microsoft side. It always goes back and say the same thing. Uh, what it says is uh, how many times you're going to write the same logic every time. Okay, so for example, uh, if you in any any common validation, if you take a look at it, these are the common set of uh, validations that you normally do on any web based application or any normal even it's not only web based application, it's any data driven application. It could be a Windows as well. So you basic thing you might see in our in our example we see the permanent address or the address of the department I left it blank uh, and it blew up because uh, the the code I'm looking for it's not about specific code it's a business rule that the address of a department is mandatory so that's a required field validator that comes into play and again comparer validator is going to compare with two different inputs in, in ideal usage if you see in a very commonly used is the when you create an account you create a password for that uh, wherein you uh, it always asks you to read enter the password so the password number one and password number two need to be same so to go ahead so that's a very common scenario wherein the comparator validator comes into play and the other one is a range validator and the reg uh, regular expression validator and the custom validator and the validation summary so these are the uh, uh, standard six tool set available out of box in ASP.NET we'll see one of them in detail so the required field validator as we just spoke about um, it ensures that the user does not skip a form entry field. So if you apply the required field validator to, to a given control, um, how, we'll do that uh, for department page and we'll see how it's going to work, okay? We'll just walk through all these validators at a high level summary and then we'll start implementing them. So the required field validator's control is available out of box. I can bring it and attach to any given control and uh, the rule is applied. You don't have to write any piece of code for that. Any JavaScript you don't have to write and you don't have to even, uh, of course, any .NET code as well. And of course, this is again a client-side validation. This is all we're talking about is a client-side validation and these controls, so ASP.NET controls, work at the client side, not at the server side. And the range validator checks the user's input based upon the lower and upper level range of numbers of characters. It's the uh, same thing. Uh, if at all you want to enforce a range check, for example, we're going to use that in one of our uh, case wherein I would like to enforce uh, the employee ID. In our case, employee ID is a normal three-digit numeric value. So we're going to enforce that rule using a range validator. So three-digit in, in general, it says uh, start with 100 and uh, of course end with 999 so that's the range check uh, so the input is going to check whether the given value is false under the given uh, upper and lower limit or not so that's what it's going to do and the expression our uh, regular expression validator this is a very very powerful uh, tool actually so regular expressions are the expression it's a language by itself I don't have a, a quick example here but I can actually quickly browse through the internet so it's a language of its own, in other words, I would say. So this is how the uh, expressions would go. Using these expressions, you can actually validate any standard patterns or the data types that you're looking for. Okay, dot net. Yeah, this is the one I think I'm looking for. This is the whole library available wherein you can actually pick and choose uh, which one you want to use. So this is a regexlib.com. So these are the patterns or the samples you can actually make use of it. So, so as you see, it's a language of its own wherein you can actually use the respective um, uh, escape sequence characters to validate the input. In a, in a simple example, in one of the examples we have used for validating the email address, so if you see the standard format or expression of an email address, it has a sum text before and at the rate symbol and the sum text followed by another rate symbol and a dot and followed by sum text. That's the usual pattern of an email ID looks like. And of course, the text can be in al alphabets or numbers and so on. Actually, you can use the regular expression to 
validate so many things even for example the phone phone number uh, you can actually see that the user entered in the right uh, format in US we know it is a three digit area code followed by a three digit uh, number and a four digit number so that's how we uh, format a given phone number so that format again we can uh, validate using a regular expression. So it's a very open open language, uh, expression language that you can make use of it to validate it. This itself will actually surface a lot of validation rules that you want to apply on any given input. So, so you can explore more on this area in our, I'm going to show you a demo where and we're going to use this for validating an email address. Okay. And the comparer validator is again, as we did, uh, did talk about this, um, it allows allows the comparison between the user input and another item uh, using a comparison operator. It could be a equals, a greater than, or less than, and so on. So as uh, you can imagine, uh, the one of the good usage is the password uh, password entry, wherein the password or re-enter password, both the passwords need to be, make sure that they are same in those scenarios you can make use of the comparer validator also you can also make use of these uh, to ensure that the age for example is uh, is within the given uh, age dimensions for example you want to uh, make sure the people who logs in must be 18 years or above those kind of validations you need you can use the comparer validator wherein you can check the keyed in value is greater than 18 or less than 100 something like that that's the compa uh, of course that if you want to check between between uh, two numbers then there's a range validator you can go with and it, this is a compare validator is going to be checking whether it's a greater than or equal to a given number okay so there's a slight difference between both hope you understand and the last one is the custom validator so this is a this is again open to you so if none of these uh, of, of four validators uh, fulfill your need, you have your custom validator. And it can happen. Um, cases like uh, you have um, uh, you, uh, user input attributes are dependent on each other. For example, kind of a rule like uh, uh, ideally the email address must have the first name or last name of the given user. If you want really want to check, that means your validation is actually spanning across multiple user input attributes. So in which case um, you can go with a custom validation wherein you can apply a server side or a client side script and uh, associate to it. And it behaves a little differently. All of the other validators are completely client side. So when it comes to the custom validator, if you are having a server side uh, validation script or function, then of course the, uh, the round trip will happen to the server to validate it. Otherwise, you can also have a client side script. But when you have a client side uh, function script, you almost you always need to have a equivalent uh, script at the server side also to ensure it's valid from both the sides. Okay, so that's the custom validator wherein you can hook up any scripts uh, or any JavaScript in general or a .NET function that you can write at the server side and associate to it. It's going to fire that for you. And of course, the last one comes the validation summary. So, well, this summary is a, uh, is a control that's going to be a placeholder. We did actually use this and we have been seeing in our project and I did even cover how did I made a custom uh, validation summary control which is uh, embedded within our base page controller and we are using it in all of our pages to show the summary of the errors. So this, in by default, if you have a validation summary control and any of these uh, uh, validation controls, you don't have you don't have to really write any piece of code, and the validation summary is going to be implicitly bound to all of these controls and show the errors in the page. So that's what by default behavior, and of course it's not that easy to actually customize the validation summary control because the items that you're going to add up to the validation summary control uh, are not direct. So that's the reason we actually did a workaround to achieve that. If I go back to my uh, base page, and this is my customized uh, custom validation summary control, wherein if I walk in to the code. So the validation summary control always expects uh, to have a validation control. Uh, and any messages that you assign to a validation validation control that only can be bound to it. So it's not like a collection that wherein you can go and add it up. 
So that's the reason it's a little complicated. Uh, for which what I did here is add it's a validator again. So in this case, base dot validator dot add. It's uh, it's actually associated to the dummy validator here. So to make that happen, um, I added dummy validator, uh, which inherits from the i validator, and which will take the uh, the messages that I'm trying to add up. So that's the kind of a workaround we need to do to use the customization of the custom uh, validation summary control. Okay, and the conclusion. So you. Obviously, the conclusion is that uh, you need to have both the client-side validation and server-side validation. And in the worst case, uh, if you want to skip something, then you can skip the client-side validation. But server-side validation is always recommended to have because of the reasons we just talked about. Okay, so that's about the ASP.NET validations. And now we go and uh, implement, apply the validations on our page to ensure that we have a couple of rules enforced there. So all, out, of the, out of the box, I'm just going to create some rules for myself. In this case, um, I have a department, uh, for example. This uh, view is not going to be helpful anyway. Go back, uh, let's come back here. So as we see that the, there is no validation for the name, I want to apply a required field validator for the name, which is department name, this is text box. And I, what I'm going to do is add a required field validator. So it's going to check out. Again, so I'm, I'm used to go back to the code and do it. Otherwise, from the toolbox, you can also drag and drop the validation controls here. Okay. In this case, if I, I want to go for a required field validator, I can simply drag and drop it. And I got the code snippet there. So, okay, in this case, that's fine. I'm going to say txt name required field validator, some name, so that I can track it properly. Okay. And, of course, it's run at server and an error message. So, that's what I need to do. So, okay, I say please enter department name. Okay, and what else I need? The most important thing I need is, um, although the control is added up, I need to actually hook this control to the given control, which I want to validate. So that will be control to validate txt name. Okay, so this is the control that I want to validate, and I'm associating uh, the required field validator to validate this control and validate what it's going to, of course, by the nature of the required field validator, it's going to check the some values entered in the, in this box. So I'm not writing any uh, script here. Okay, it's plain control. And what else I would like to see? I would like to also see um, display. Display, if I make it uh, dynamic, then it's going to pop up on the uh, text box itself. And it's going to, in addition to the summary control. Okay, and of course, you can also have a validation group that you can specify. In this case, I'm not going with for the validation group. What this is going to helpful, uh, uh, help help you is that if you if at all a case is like the same page, you might have a different rule set for different scenarios. For example, I'm using this same page for uh, creating a new department as well as updating the department. So I might have a rule uh, different for creating a new one and updating it. Uh, old one. So in that case, I can do. I can have. I can differentiate based on the validation group. Okay. So in this case, if I want to apply this is required for insert, then I will apply as a the rules are called insert uh, and otherwise update so on. So I I can uh, invoke the respect to of course the respect to validation from my code behind to fire the respect to validations and uh, do it. So right now I'm going to apply by default both uh, for both the scenarios the same rules going to apply in the, in my case. Okay, so for now we are good. Okay, so this is the field I wanted to add, and there are a couple of more properties if you want to explore. Uh, you are you are most welcome. So you can always uh, explore this. Uh, there are a couple of more like enable client script. This is the property that if you enable this to true or false, then it's going to enable whether it's going to validate the client side or not. 
The same thing you can apply to the validation summary as well so that uh, you can enable or disable the, gi the given control validation of the client side. And a couple of more interesting ones um, that you might want to see is enable another one uh, wherein you can enable an, a thing, an error message we did talk about and also I think there is something called uh, initial value is not something we want and text and text I would like to specify uh, the same like an error message but for now okay let's keep it simple we, we don't want to drag this too long um, so that's how the control goes we can actually apply this uh, here and the second case the txt h40 so I, in this case I want to apply the range check where well, I want to ensure that um, the values entered uh, are between at least three digit number in this case range check one data I'll say server run, run it is equal to server and ID is equal to txt h4d range check and of course error message is equal to please enter value between 100 and 999 so this ensures that uh, it's um, between 3 digit number and as of course I would like to say enabled is equal to true so true and what else I need and that's all I think for now um, so I uh, guess that's the most important thing is the of course we need to specify the range uh, which is going to be a minimum value of course, the text, as, as I mentioned, the text, as I mentioned, 109999, uh, it's just a text. It's not going to really enforce that rule unless until I specify the minimum value as 100 and maximum value as 999. Okay, perfect. So this is how I can apply it to the respective control. Of course, another important thing I forgot, control to validate. That's the... Uh, that's a very important one otherwise it doesn't know which control to validate okay perfect so this will this should take care and coming back to the address so this is my custom user control right this is my user control wherein I within which I actually exposed a property called the enable validation and in this case I actually applied it as false now I am going to set it to true so let's go and quickly walk through the enable validation inside my user control. What it really looks like under user controls. Okay, I'm going to open this. So does it have the same controls to validate? Yes. So I have the same controls within my uh, address ASCX, which is my user control, and apply the same logic, uh, same controls here. But the uh, thing I'm doing here is I'm actually managing the enable part or disable part in my code based on the property value that has been set to. In this case, enable validation is a property that I'm can able to access it from my parent here, uh, parent form, enable validation. In this case, I set to fall, I mean, it's true. So it's all comes from set here. This is a, just a property and it's only a set only, write only property. It doesn't have a get, if you see. And in this case, I'm actually setting the value, whatever is assigned to it, to the respective required field validator controls or validation controls. So all these are the required field validators. And also, I'm actually uh, changing the mandatory one. Uh, in this case, of course, I need to apply the same thing. What happens here is, although I'm, I make it mandatory, I need to see those red asterisks. Uh, to ensure that it is uh, mandatory so that the users know that it is mandatory. How can I do that? Uh, in this case the text box txt name is a required field so I want to make sure that the user know that this is required. Uh, that I'm going to specify along with my department for this I'm going to use a simple uh, span tag with uh, respect to uh, style sheet called um, mandatory. This, this style sheet is going to make it red and other things. So it just have a couple of formattings that I'm going to apply. This is just a mandatory, which is going to be just a star. Okay. And we'll run this code and see.
So what we are doing now is a client side validation completely. Okay, as we see all these red asterisks are now visible. So this is coming from the spam and the mandatory style sheet which makes the asterisk red in color and similarly when I soon after I enable the validation true all I see is this. Okay, so line one is mandatory, city is mandatory, state is mandatory. So as now, as of now, if I hit save, then I see the validation, Oops, the error messages. So the, please enter the department name and address line one, city, and so on. So which is fair enough. But I don't see the HOD, which is head of the department. So I want to put some wrong value there and see. And also, if you notice the dynamic text that popped up here next to the control. I can see the please enter department name and also I see the dynamic text next to the control. So ideally you can uh, skip the validation control in the page and also do the same thing. Okay, so, you, so that user won't see this validation summary but they see the error next to the control. Okay, in this case soon after I uh, lost the focus on the control I see the validation coming up here 199. So this is cool. Another cool thing I would say, uh, let's see the source control. Source, sorry. Let's see the source and see what exactly happening, uh, what got rendered out. Okay, so in this case, it's all pure Java. If you see the code, you need to go at the bottom and it's uh, completely the object model that we see that we have been discussing. So this is the Java script that's been rendered out. And as you see, this is completely a object model, um, document.all. If you if you know the Java programs uh, scripting language, then you can understand all this. This is completely the script that has been uh, rendered out from the .NET processing engine. Okay, so this sits at the client side, and the script is going to run and going to validate your page. So now after, after doing the doing the control, sorry, uh, hitting the save, I see the validation summary also updated with the respective message, 100. So here the request did not go to the server. How do I ensure? I will go back and what I do is I will add a breakpoint if at all it's not there. Okay. I'll add a breakpoint of the page load. Okay, and now I will hit save. Does it come there? No, it did not go to the server side. It's happening at the client side only. And now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to enter some text now. Uh, in this case, I'll say test 21 and uh, head of department, oh, head of department is 10 save. 8, I hope 108 is there and the address now, okay now in this case I'll hit save and see now I still have the validation on my address so the two are gone. In this case I'll say test 21 street okay and city is uh, test 21 everything is test 21 okay and the state is uh, say PA and I hit save, now the control came to my page load. So it indicates that now the request is sent to the server. Okay, now I hit run and the new item is added up. So now I added a logic, uh, soon after I save it, I navigate back to my search page. So that's why, that's why it's coming back to the uh, search page, refreshing the content that I have just keyed in. Okay. So now we are done with the client side validation. But again as we discussed, uh, client side validation is not sufficient. We need to do a server side validation also. Okay, so that will bring us to the server side validation. There are numerous ways you can actually do a server side validation. Okay, in our case, uh, we are actually doing using the business objects, which is our uh, business layer, layer, wherein the all the business logic or validation, everything resides in the business layer. And now we're going to get into the business layer, which is our domain object model. So if you remember, the, all the validations are inside our domain object model. If I go to the address and I see there is a something interface called I 
business rule which we have uh, done as part of a dis uh, initial design and each of our domain object model is actually implementing the I business rule and what does it have it has only one method called the validate business rules so what it ensures is I need to actually implement the business rules inside my code and yes if I drill down into my business rules this is my implementation for validate business rules and within this right now the code that you're seeing is the code that's making use of the uh, enterprise application enterprise application block for validation in other words it's called as VAB VAB let me say this we are actually making use of VAB which is called validation application block okay and the assemblies that we are making use of uh, here are the validation this is from the enterprise library validation block okay so how to make use of the validation block to do it there are again numerous ways or numerous options available for you to apply the validation uh, one of the option is using the configuration okay and how can we make sure how can we configure it's again so for the given type for example in in this uh, project what I made is a couple of uh, flavors so one of the flavor is using the configuration of enterprise library and there's another flavor called use, using the attribute driven and there's another flavor called data annotations and of course there's another uh, flavor which falls uh, like uh, your custom implementation completely a function based implementation wherein you can get rid of the web no web in, if there is no web, what I will do normally here is a control check, right? In this case, address, if there is no web, okay, we'll step into each one of them uh, uh, in order. If there is no web, how will you write? You will write saying, okay, if this dot address line one, uh, since that is a string, I will say string dot is null or white space okay so this is how you will ideally write the code okay so in this case if this condition satisfies okay that means this is an error okay send me uh, add an uh, add an uh, text message to this error that's how you normally write so this is a traditional way that you can do even now you can do there's nothing wrong with that you can still do it there's nothing wrong okay but we going to uh, go with the rapid application phase right so as we see how did I how much time it took uh, to valid, uh, apply the validation at the client side almost a matter of uh, minutes right even the whole project we're actually doing uh, in a couple of hours if you consider um, so that we are in the rapid application phase so we want to leverage available tools in this case what I'm going to make use of it is a enterprise library again the same question goes revolves back how many times you're going to write a code to check its required field right so at the client side we addressed it now we're going to uh, did I check it out so I wanted to actually check it out so that we will not have any problem so now right now I'm going to open the enterprise library configuration tool so within then uh, we did actually take a look at the other sections in the last one and the only only one section left uh, is the validation settings so in this case what what did I do I actually picked the employee class in other words my type how did I pick that just give me a second let me make it a full screen so you can also always go and add add type to validate this is going to list out all the assemblies that are available within your project that are referred to and in this case if I see my project available here my HR project I don't see it's get uh, get listed here in other case I can actually go and uh, add from the GAC or add from a file okay so I can go and pick my class file and add it to it and then that's how you get the class my employee this is nothing but my employee class within my DOM where is my employee DOM 
within my DOM I have an employee CS. So it's actually referring to this employee. So I actually made use of the enterprise library configuration based validation by uh, for the employee and for address I did it in a different way so that we actually see it, all the flavors. So in this case I have a rule set defined Again, as I mentioned, this rule set uh, for enterprise library is something relevant to the validation group at the client side. Okay, it's uh, both are identical. In this case, the rule set, I can apply multiple rule sets for the same employee and validate them. Okay, good. So in this case, it's all configuration driven. You don't have to really write a piece of code. And in this case, uh, I did I did a rule set and within this rule set I'm actually validating my date of birth which is part of my employee class that's one of the property which is public property to do all these kind of validations which is the required required validator okay and if I expand this the message I want to give is given here okay and uh, negative uh, negative this is something a little different so it's uh, a negation of a required validator that means you can actually leave it optional so that's why right. so negated is available for many of the validations that you're doing uh, you can make use of it and the expression in this case the regular expression is used for email validation so in this case uh, email ID validator this is a validator available out of box which does the email validator and this is the regular expression that we are talking about and out of box you can I can't even resize this but of course I can show you so this is a regular expression that's out of box available and expression looks like this it's pretty much look, looking for some text before at the rate symbol and some text after the at the rate symbol and followed by a dot and so on uh, that's, that's the internet email address and similarly you can also pick the phone number validations which is out of box. You don't have to really Google out and bring in the expression and do it. And of course at the worst case if you want to pick the custom you can also pick the custom and apply the validation. And regular expression is uh, something you can actually use in many places. As I mentioned there is a regular expression validator at the client side control. You can pick the control, apply the expression to a given control, it will validate. And in web based validations, it's available in this way as a part of the editor. And also, you can make use of the regular expression in the code as well. There's something called a reg x validator uh, class, reg x class, which you can make use of it to validate any given controls. So it's available at multiple locations and for multiple uses. In web, it's out of box. I don't even have to look for the given control. I can also pick the year, the German postal code and also a couple of even uh, multilingual, I think J Japanese phone number, postal code and so on. It's available out of the box. In this case I'm going to leave it as is and of course if you, if you want to add uh, more validators you can also pick from the add validators and these are different set of validators available for you to pick from. And out of that couple of uh, very interesting ones or useful ones are the string length validator where you want to check a max length of a given string and so on and object validator and a domain validator this is, a, this is another interesting one which can be mapped to your business rules and a given domain object uh, rules and not null validator and so on so it's um, a bunch of other things available a couple of them are similar to what we see in the uh, client side validators which is a range check validator or, or regular expression validator and a relative date time validator and so on you can uh, enterprise library is completely uh, configuration based. You don't have to write any piece of code. Uh, that's one thing you need to keep in mind. Uh, as, as much you know about the configuration and uh, how to make use of it, that's all your knowledge takes. Of course, it's going to be a very narrow or a very sharp, um, sometimes it's going to be a very lengthy learning curve to understand the enterprise library configuration. Once you understand it, it's going to be like a cakewalk. You can actually do your coding uh, in a minutes and also it is very, very flexible. In this case, once I apply my configuration here in this way um, and apply it, what I can do is just close it and whatever I do in this tool, again, one more important uh, information about the tool, the Enterprise Configuration Library tool that we are looking at is, the, is from the 5.0 version which is not uh, that intuitive in the older versions. So 
this is the first time I'm seeing a very big usage of the uh, tool and uh, otherwise earlier I used to uh, work completely from the configuration file itself and never made use of the tool and this is the first time I see because because it's not that intuitive and also not complete and once I save it it's um, added up to your code and in this case the validation if I expand the validation tab here so this is what it added up to my code uh, to my configuration file and I am actually making use of the enterprise library uh, configuration based validation here okay so this is the if you take a look at this this is the type at the at the root this is the type we're actually validating which is my project dot dom uh, and employee so this is the type that I'm validating and similarly of course uh, you don't have to really go to the tool if you really don't want and uh, for that you can actually copy this and apply the same rule set to a different object that also you can do but there's one drawback with the configuration based validation but before we see the drawback we see the advantage the advantage with this configuration based is uh, once you are done with your coding you deploy the application all these rules are available in the configuration file so that means you can change any of the validation rules uh, or without touching the source code that's a major advantage okay so in the code and the other disadvantage is that um, if at all in this case if you see the if I had to, just to validate one domain object object I have to add so much of uh, code here and sometimes it's a, it's just one object here and only few validation rules uh, imagine a real-time production in, uh, production application you might have a 20 30 or 100 objects and you can rationalize how difficult or uh, will that be to manage just the configuration it's going to be like a uh, pain in neck in general so that's the one big drawback with the configuration based validation and of course in the uh, web.config there uh, you can actually split the files uh, into different files that you can do actually using that what, what what will make it happen is that you can always have a different one config file uh, for one object that way you can break it you can do that you can do that uh, but the entry point for configuration is still going to be your web.config and where in the config sections whenever you specify the section in this place you're going to actually redirect to a different file that you can do actually usually people do ask uh, such kind of questions and it is completely doable in uh, in the .NET. it's not new but it's uh, starting from 2.0 or probably prior to that also and that's how the configuration uh, system is designed in .NET. in which case you can actually take this whole validation block whatever I have here into a different file and uh, you can manage the configuration there you can still do that okay okay so that's one drawback and now another thing here is uh, of course I added the valid uh, validation rules and this is again for rule set if you remember there is a one rule set yeah this is a rule set within the type I have a, a rule set that's an immediate thing and I can define any number of rule sets here but how to invoke uh, this validation so that invoke code is all gone back to my validate business rules of course I just added a configuration unless until someone invokes it it's not going to be working right so in this case employee if you see it's all plain just uh, like a normal class nothing is decorated and no difference with this only thing is that the uh, the validate business rule block is implemented and the implementation goes like this it's actually doing the validate validator factory this is the enterprise library code this is going to be a generic code you just have to create an instance uh, current instance of the validation factory and then uh, the validator within the validator we are passing the type here so this is what makes a difference since I'm passing the employee to the validator and asking it to validate this rule set in the constructor okay so employee insert rule set and then fire the uh, custom validator dot validate and validate this so if you remember this is a keyword that refers to the current reference current instance that means I'm actually passing the in current instance of the employee object so with the data of course the now the data is available inside this object and I'm passing that to validate again is the employee type that I referred in the configuration file 
with this given rule set. Okay, so what it's what the validator is going to do? It's going to take this object, and first of all, of course, before that, it's actually initialized the validator with the employee type in the web.config. It's going to load this section and of course the respective ones and also it's going to check for the employee insert which is my rule set here employee insert and of course this name must match otherwise it's not going to fire and then once you do validate this instance it's going to take the values that you have specified in this object and apply all the rules that are defined in this configuration that's how the rule set validation is going to work at the configuration base. In other words, rule set you can still apply uh, in the code also. Rule set uh, that this some people refer to this as a rule set validation, but I don't think this is a kind of a rule set validation. It's a configuration driven validation because the rule set is not specific to the configuration. You can still apply the rule set in the code also in other types of validation. Okay, so this is a configuration driven validation which is taken care. Of. And uh, the next one is the other flavor. The other flavor is the annotation based or the attribute decoration. So in this case, uh, what we are using is the, the, of course, we are making use of the enterprise library, uh, enterprise library uh, assemblies here, uh, within which we have the enterprise library validation, and the validator is the code that goes in the uh, valid business rules, and within the validation we have a couple of uh, attributes called the hash self validation. We'll come back to the hash self validation after covering the other ones. Uh, so these are actually speaking, I did not actually made use of the um, the the validators available within the validation. I actually made use of the data annotations here. So in this example, so data annotations comes from the component model, and the data annotation has a similar attribute driven validations, which is called required. Uh, and again, if I if I go with the not null validator, so this not null validator is actually from the enterprise library, uh, which is similar to required field validator. Okay, so there's a slight difference. Otherwise, the the required validator here the, uh, attribute is coming from the as you see the um, the namespace itself is coming from the data annotations. Okay, and the not null, which is an equivalent for that, is uh, is coming from the validations. Okay, so that makes a slight difference here. So um, although it's a similar way you can apply uh, using the uh, using the enterprise library validators or using the data annotation validators. Okay, so in this case we made use of the data annotation, and we have the required field validator and error message is, is just a message like this. This is if you see this code, this is similar to the way I did in the client side validation which is on the ASPX page. So I can do the same attribute driven validation in my code and I'm not writing any single piece of code here. I'm just using making use of the attributes. And of course did I tell you that we can also have our own custom attributes? We can actually write our own. Uh, it need not be your own uh, validation in this case in general. In general all these validators or attributes you can actually have a custom attributes created and decorate your objects with them and you can gain that flavor. And specific to the validations you can of course write your own validators uh, and uh, implement it. In general case uh, the way I did uh, in the couple of projects is that uh, in this case uh, Although this is a required field validator, I want to ch uh, check if the value that's entered to this given field is, uh, if it is blank, it's okay, no problem. But if you enter some value, I want to make sure that it uh, falls within certain criteria. A typical usage would be like, uh, uh, for example, if I someone enters an employee ID or an employee name, I want to go and do a database lookup and see whether this ID is valid or not. Or I mean to say, this exa that example would be for a department ID, for example. Uh, if someone puts a department ID to your object and I want to make sure the department ID is valid, valid or not by doing a database lookup or some other lookup. So that kind of implementations, you might go with the custom attributes implementation that you can very well do it. Okay, there are a lot of articles that are offline. You can actually explore if you're all really interested. And here it's completely attribute driven. And uh, I made use of the required uh, string length 
and there are a couple of more. Uh, and here, I, here again, I'm making use of the, use of the um, not null validator, and also the required field validator. But this is, doesn't make any sense. But I'm going to get get rid of this. And the zip is required, and the string length. And here comes the self validation. So as we see, the limitation with uh, these attributes is that it you can apply this only for a given property. Okay, what if you want to validate, uh, have a validation that span across multiple things? Um, for example, you want to make sure that in this case, the way I implemented here is, okay, someone entered address line two without entering address line one. Okay, that can happen, right? So how do you do that? So in this case, I want to check if, uh, okay, user must enter the address line one to make use of the address line two also. See, it's not like, uh, it's not uh, like uh, you enter something here, you don't enter something here, and you enter something here, and it's valid, okay? So of course, I to enforce that, I already have a required field validator here on my address line one, which will take care of it. I'm just uh, throwing out a scenario wherein uh, if your scenario of business rules span across multiple fields for implementing that kind of validation, you always can go and implement a self-validation. But self-validation, you need to actually decorate with uh, the class level. The, you need to notify the uh, validator that the, this given type has a self-validation. Okay, that's important. And once you have, once you decorate that has self-validation, then you need to, you can write your own function. In this case, I have written my own function, which is again decorated with the self-validation. Okay? So again, in this case, I can also have rule set here. That's what I was trying to say. I can now always say a rule set also here. In which case, when I invoke this, I can specify that, okay, apply, uh, run the validations for this given rule set the way you see in the configuration, okay? It's failing because of that closed brackets. But anyway, we're not going to do that, but just wanted to show you that that's doable. Okay, and uh, within the self-validation, it's my custom code. This is my just plain C-sharp code. I'm just checking to see um, that checking address line one. I want to see the address line one and then make sure it is there. And if it is not there, then I'm going to actually add the validation message as a validation result. So the validator is going to give you a validation re validation result which can have the set of values like this. Uh, in this case, I made use of the the error message and and of course the control name that caused the error. Okay, the, this is going to be a text message that's going to be transformed offline. Okay, so that's uh, that's all the two different flavors. Implicitly, we actually also see this uh, the third flavor which is using the uh, WAM-based validations uh, using the attributes. And of course, we also see the uh, data annotations, which is similar, which is uh, going, to be, going to be similar, but only thing is that it's a different attributes available. And of course, to fire those validation, we always come back to the validate business rules. In this case, validate business rules, it's uh, the standard line of core that goes in here. And in this case, I am passing the type to validate is address. And of course, the current instance, I'm passing this. And in this case, I don't have a rule set. In other case, if I have a rule set, then I will pass the rule set as part of the constructor for this validation factory, which is a require, create validator. So if, if, you, if you're ever wondering about the design patterns, this is a very good example of a factory pattern. So internally, uh, you see the factory pattern usage everywhere almost in the uh, ASP.NET or applications. It's there with the uh, with your authentication or authorization uh, model wherein you can configure different authorization or authentication providers in the configuration side which again going to be created instance of the respective ones at the runtime based on your setup and in this case the respective validation of the validation factory it has a factor of validators and you're actually picking the respective validator that can validate this given type. And if you remember this less than and greater than codes, we have been talking about this uh, in our generic sessions, right? So this indicates that the validator is a generic valid validator that can take a given type. And in this case, it's taking address. In another case, it's taking the employee. So that's the generic validator. And the factory is going to create instance of fit and uh, 
pinpoint the validate method. Again, the validate itself is an interface uh, contract that's going to be applied to it. Again, that's a deviation to the current topic. If it all just, uh, if you're interested, and that's very important. If you know design patterns, that's again uh, adds uh, more weight to your resume. It's always good to go and explore. And in this case, we are looking at the very good example of a factory pattern. Okay, that's taken care. Of. And what else we have with the validation? Okay, now we're going to apply this same rule uh, for our department as well. So right now department, I'm going to just take this code as is and go to my department and apply the server-side validation. So this is what I'm server-side validation I'm going to do. And remember this uh, this piece of code is available as part of my, our design itself because I'm implementing the iBusiness rule. Okay, I'm going to dump this code. Check out. Okay, so in this case, what I need to do is, I'll say department. Oops, department and department. And of course, you're going to do the validation. So this is a standard routine that I can make use of it. It's going to just validate my department. But of course, to validate it, I have to uh, specify a couple of things. Uh, what are those? Uh, here, description, of course, I can leave it optional. My key thing is uh, HOD, I can leave that optional. And of course, location, I want to keep this. Uh, I want to make it as a mandatory. So in this case, I have the references added up. I want to uh, specifically, I'm looking for the name. Yes, name is here. I want to make this name um, required, required and uh, I'm going to pass in the oops. this is the named proper uh, parameters that I can pass in in this case I'm going to pass error message error message is equal to say enter department name okay and remaining things, uh, I can also make use of them, but uh, in this case, I don't want to, uh, which is fine. And that's all I need. And also the other one is uh, string length validator. And this validator is coming from the web validators. Otherwise, data annotations, I can also pick either of them, okay? And in this case, uh, same thing, error message is equal to, um, Please enter uh, at, at least uh, five characters. Okay, I'm trying to enforce that. And the minimum length. Minimum length is equal to five. Oh yeah, I think I need I need to pass uh, the minimum value here, which is five, and then that's the constructor itself is taking. Uh, if you if you take a look at these named parameters, one of them is uh, mandatory. That's what uh, important here: the minimum length and the, of course followed by the named parameters. Named parameters are kind of optional parameters which you can pick any of these, whereas uh, the given um, parameter is mandatory. So that's what it's scripting for. I'm passing the minimum value as phi there and it should be good. Fine. So now what else we need to do here is a self-validation or for address. Location address is mandatory. I'm going to apply as uh, not null validator in this case and I say error message is equal to address is required. Okay, perfect. So in this case I need to, if I specify this as null, then this should fire. Good. And once I did this, I'm of course I'm actually implemented, I uh, also implemented the valid business rule, but I have to invoke this rule. 
and I have to invoke this rule before making the database call. Definitely, that will be happening only in the BWL. So in this case, where am I? Create new. So before I make uh, the database call, I need to actually make the call for the department. Department errors. Did I do this already? Address, okay, no, it's not done. So before I do this, I want to call the department, OBJ department location. I'm going to say department errors. That's going to give me again a, a array of a dictionary of intent string is equal to dot validate business rules. Okay, so that's all it needs to take and this is going to validate and give me the results. And of course, before I proceed next, I need to check if this is uh, having some errors or not. And in this case, I'm going to check if department errors dot count is greater than zero, then what I'm going to do is return it here itself. So that I'm going to exit my code, return department errors. Okay, so in this case it will not go to the next step. The return itself will uh, be end of the process. But we missed one more thing. that We actually need to also validate the uh, the address within the department. Okay, that we have not done. Okay, so that you can actually do it uh, using a self-validation. Okay. Uh, anyway, so in, in, in the interest of time, that I have done for the address. So I don't want to drag too much on that because I hope you understand. For similarly, uh, for employee, we did the same thing. Uh, inside the validate business rule, here the valid, uh, business rules. Uh, what we did here is uh, we validated the object first, validate the respective one, and then call the respective uh, mailing address validator if it is not null, and also permanent address validation if it is not null. And we are calling, making the call for the respective address uh, validate business rules uh, for the respective object. And the uh, the output we are actually merging using our helper methods and uh, returning the summary of the rules. Uh, similarly, we need to be applying for the department also. Okay, that's the summary. Okay, I don't want to go back and apply that and spend too much of time there. And we're going to run this code. Another important thing, now right now, the unless it, unless the client side validation is successful, and the if you see that the client side validation does first and then it goes to the server side validation in which case we are doing the same validation at the both the sides right so to for us to test it how can we test it because we want to send it to the server directly without being tested at the client side then only we can actually test that uh, part right so to do that okay i will cancel this oh yeah, i don't have the cancel code but i just have to go back and hit new here Okay, so in this case, what's happened? Uh, what I want to do is uh, here, it it cannot go to the server side because um, it's done at the client side. To disable such things, what we need to do is, in other words, it's not like a disable. So whenever you do such kind of validations, uh, we need to go back to our screen. Where is our UI? Okay. So all these validations will fire only when the respect to control that does the post back has a property called causes validation. So this is a key property that you need to pay attention. If the causes validation is not set to true, then the validations in the page will not fire. So in this case, I'm going to set false. And this is another beauty thing here is that uh, although I am running, I'm in running mode, I can always go back and change the designer page. I don't have to uh, kill the run and change the design. Okay, in this case, uh, ASPX alone, but the code, it doesn't allow, but the ASPX page, designer ways, I can actually go and change it and do a refresh here. 
So in this case, I hope I have a breakpoint at my page load. Okay, so I still have some validations. So please enter department name and the value cannot be null. Aren't they coming from database? Let me check. I want to have a breakpoint and then see whether we, from where these uh, errors are coming from. Okay, so I don't have a breakpoint. So hopefully they are coming from the from the database side. Okay, I'm going to apply this. So now it's actually coming to my uh, course. So it skipped the client side validation because the save button doesn't have the causes validation to true. Okay, that's how I can do that also. And another another way to do it is uh, enable client scripting to false. That way also you can do it. And in this case. Okay, how to quickly go there is by our create new. It should be coming to this place definitely. And okay, I'm going to run this F10 and see the errors. Yes, those are the rules that we are specifying here. They are actually coming from my business rules. Okay, that's clear because they are actually raised at the core side, at the server side. Good. And we can also drill down into the respective uh, department and see the business rules validation here. Then this will be more clear for us. And return. And here you go. It returns the two rules. So department name and the value cannot be null. And the value is for the, ad, uh, the location address. So those are the two validations that we added up. Good. So the server side validation is done and the client side validation is done. And in this case, I'm going to say test 99 and I will say 108 test 99 city is, uh, okay. This time, let me see if it is, has any errors. It still have an error. Please enter at least five characters. Very good. So this is from my, I did not specify which control, but um, at least five characters. I believe this is for what? Which control did I put that? Is it for name? What name? I forgot for which control I added that validation. This is for the name, but it's already exceeding five. Oh, that means it's exceeded five, probably. That's what it means to say. So one, two, three, four. Test, I would say. So, which is fine. So the test is what the max check is doing, and we are good. So we did the uh, both the client side validation and the server side validation, which is perfect. And with this, I believe this uh, uh, project is taken care of and, and we'll uh, continue with the WCF and um, of course the reports and SSIS all to the next session. So we just completed session 33 and in this session we did walk through the uh, implementing the department module, uh, the search scenario implementation. Uh, and also how to retrieve a, a department uh, uh, scenario. We did completed that and also update scenario we did complete with department module. We did see a detailed deep dive into the ASP.NET validations, uh, both the client side as well as the server side validations. And also using the validations, uh, using the validation controls which are out of box in ASP.NET. Also, we did walk through the validations uh, using the function-based validation. And also, we did walk through the web-based validations uh, uh, covering the enterprise library offerings. Uh, and we did see the three different flavors of web-based validations uh, uh, with the configuration-driven, data annotations-driven, and attribute-driven. And we'll continue with the WCF in the next session.